الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم إني أعوذ بك من الحمى والحزن وأعوذ بك من العز والكسل وأعوذ بك من الجبن والبخل وأعوذ بك من غلبة الدين وقحل الرجال اللهم إني أسألك العفو والعافية والمعافاة الدائمة في ديني ودنياي وأحبه مالي اللهم استر عوراتي وعمر عوراتي صلى الله تعالى على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين برحمتك يا رحم الرحمين when the revelation came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the few people at the beginning accepted the religion. His beloved wife, Sayyidina Khadija, and then his best friend, Sayyidina Abu Bakr, and his cousin, Sayyidina Ali, and a few other here and there. It, you know, it wasn't kind of like a whole group of people who started coming into Islam, and that didn't happen. Until the sixth year of Islam, when Sayyidina Umar became Muslim, he was one of the young Shabab. He was about 26 years old, but he was educated, he could write, he could read, and he was one of the greatest warriors that he had. So when he became Muslim, then a lot of the, the weaker people who wanted to become Muslim, but out of the fear of Quraysh couldn't become Muslim, they started becoming Muslim. And the thought started to grow. But things didn't get any easier with the Islam of Sayyidina Umar. Uh, they went through economic sanction. And then the ninth year of uh, Revelation was uh, an amazing year. It was, it was, it was a year that uh, many things happened. One of the things that happened, the beloved wife the tw for 25 years with the Prophet وسلم, and he was only married to Sayyidina Khadija for 25 years and that was the only wife that he had. And she dies. She passes away and she was a spiritual support. She was the, any type of support that you can imagine. She was there for the Prophet And then Abu Talib who's his uncle and who's a shield between the Prophet and the Quraysh, he dies as well. So now the Quraysh are kind of unleashed and they can, there's nobody to hold them against the Prophet So he was looking for Ansar and then he goes to Ta'if. And this is where Taif is, is beloved to him because he was raised around that area because Halima Sa'diya was from that area. So he goes to Taif to ask for support to become his Ansar because his own people are not listening to him and are not giving him the, the, the Nasr, the victory that he is looking for. They, we know the story, they reject the message and they throw him out of the city. When he comes back, you know, one of the things in the Quran when you read, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna ma'al usri yusra. So, Inna ma'al usri yusra. Inna ma'al usri yusra. Indeed, with every hardship, there's an ease. This is how the Sunnah of Allah works in this dunya. Every, every night has a dawn. Every day has a night. Every up has its down. Every down has its up. That's how it is. That's how you will experience life from the time you're born till the time you die. That's how, this, that's how Allah has made it. And then uh, is something really amazing happened. It's called the Isra and Miraj. So the Prophet is taken on this amazing journey on this ninth year as a reward for what happened in Taif. Because he said Taif was the worst day of my life. So Allah rewarded him with the best night of his life. Right? So he goes and he, he goes to a point that Jibreel can't go no more. Right? Mawlana says in the, in the Mathrawi, he said, Go of Jibreel or Bipar and Darpayam, go of Ro Ro, Man Harifi to He said, Oh, Jibreel, why don't you accompany me? Why don't you accompany me and go any further with me? He said, No, no, I can't. You are in a class of your own. I can't go no more. He went to the Divine Presence and he was with his Lord. And when he was leaving, something amazing happened. And this is in Fakhruddin al Razi's commentary. The Prophet said to his Lord, he said, Oh my Lord, whenever someone returns from a journey home, they bring back, they take back some type of gift. Something for their beloveds. And this is the nature of the dunya. When we go on a trip, on a journey, we bring something to our beloveds, whether it's our wife, our children, um, our colleagues, our best friend, our cousins, whatever it is. What am I going to take back for my ummah? I want a gift to take back to my ummah. Now there's three things about gifts that you have to remember. One is gifts always would remind you 
about the place that you got them from. So, I mean, I was just recently in Turkey and I brought some stuff. Every time I look at those things from Turkey, it reminds me of Turkey. If you bring a little miniature Eiffel Tower from Paris on your last trip, every time you look at that, it would remind you of Champs-Élysées and Paris and downtown and all that because that's where you got it from. That's the nature of the gift. The second nature of the gift is gifts are given in accordance to the ability of the gift giver. This gift is coming from the Rabbul Alameen, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the third is that gifts are given in different degrees. You don't give to your wife what you would give to your cousin. You don't give to your children what you would give to your colleague. Everybody would get in terms of its value. And he says, Ya Allah, and you take the gifts to your beloveds. You don't bring gifts to everybody that you know. Only selected people. So he says, Ya Allah, what can I give? I can take from this journey for my ummah. Which means all of us are Prophet's beloved. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He has love for all. He didn't say, what kind of gift I take for, you know, Abu Bakr and Umar, my two best friends, Ali, my cousin. What can I take for? No. He said, for my ummah. For all of us. Now if you look at the Prophet's time, he is the economic sanction. Uh, no, no, uh, no power whatsoever. They can't, the, 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 the defense comes in five years after this incident, that they can defend themselves and they have the battles in Medina. They need victory, they need support. There's a fear in Mecca. So they need something to battle this. Allah is going to give him a gift that's going to take care of everything. And he says to him, I'm going to give you the gift of Salah, the gift of prayer. What an amazing gift that Allah has given this Ummah. This is the most amazing gift that on the night of Isra and Mi'raj, Allah gives to his beloved, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Habibullah, that's his title, his most beloved. He gives it to him, the gift from his inexhaustible treasure houses. You can imagine what Allah has in his inexhaustible treasure houses. And he picks this gift, here you go, I give you the gift of Salah. This is a mi'raj for your, for your ummah. That you came here one time, they can come here spiritually five times a day. Because the gift should take you back to the place that the gift was sent from. It should remind you of the place that every time you pray, you should go to the Divine Presence. That's what the prayer is. This is why the Prophet wasallam said that a servant is closest to his Lord when he's in prostration. A servant is closest to his Lord when he's in prostration, when she's in prostration. There is no veils between a servant and Allah when the person is in prostration, everything is lifted. And there's nothing between you and Allah. Nothing. This is the gift of prayer. And the gift that Allah has given, He's not discriminating. Well, He would give one gold, and He would give the second one silver, He would give the third one bronze. No. He gave everybody gold. And He said, here, I give you the gold, you make whatever out of it you want. You want to make it silver? Go ahead and make it silver. You want to, there are people who pray gold. There are people who pray silver. There are those who pray zinc. There are people who pray toxic prayer. And if you look at the prayers of the Prophet wasallam, in one of the mercy, He was sent as a mercy to all of creation that he said, pray as you have seen me pray. He didn't say pray as I pray. Had he said pray as I pray, all of our prayer would be invalid. Because nobody can pray like the Prophet wasallam. Every single cell of his body was in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he prayed. When, when he went to the prayer, one prayer, he was praying and he leaned forward, the Sahaba thought he was going to fall on his face. After the prayer said, Ya Rasulullah, what was that? He said, I was reading the verses about paradise and I could feel it. This is the prayer of the Prophet wasallam. Sayyidina Ali, when he went to the prayer, every time he was shivered. They said, Ya Ali, why are you shivering when you go to prayer? He said, this is the responsibility that the heavens and the earth rejected. 
لو انزلنا هذا القران على جبل لا رايته خاشعا متصدئا من خشيه الله that if Allah would have revealed that on the mountain that would have crushed into pieces he said they rejected it and I'm going to the prayer to stand in front of Allah and I should have shivered Zunun al Misri went to the prayer and he stood to lead the prayer he said Allah Akbar and he collapsed he stood and picked them up and said Ya Sheikh what happened he said the weight of Takbir Tahrima just the weight of getting into the prayer entering into prayer this reality that's beyond this reality. This is prayer. The Abdullah bin Mubarak was passing by and saw a woman praying and there was a scorpion on her. And the scorpion bit her four times. And there's, you know, you have the muscles that are iradi and ghayr iradi. You know, there's some muscles, you, you move yourself. Some things, it just moves, you know? Like, you know, if you go to a doctor and they hit you on the knee and, it, it, and your leg just pops up. It, you know, and when, when something bites you, there, there's that sh that sh he, he witnessed it four times. And she, she finally she goes, oh my mother, what's wrong with you? You could have just swept it away from your thigh, the scorpion. And she looked at him and said, you're a fool. I was busy with the business of God. How could I attend to my own business? I was busy with the business of God. How could I attend to my own business? This is how they pray. This is the prayer of the Salihin. This is why this, this is the mi'raj of the believers. That we can go five times a day to the divine presence. That's what we, this is what Allah has given us as a gift. But look at the way we pray. Look at the Rudaki, the great Persian poet said. He said, Rui be mihrab nahadam chisud. Dil be bukhara wa butani taraz. What's the benefit? of facing the Qibla and prostrating into the Mihrab. When your heart is in Bukhara, when your heart is in Paris, when your heart is in Bollywood, when your heart is with the superstar and the movie star and all these models. He said, He said, what the beloved, what Allah is looking for is the waswasa of love in your prayer. He's not interested in the form in your prayer, you're bowing down in your ruku and all. No, no, that's not what Allah is interested in. He's interested in the waswas of, of love in the prayer. And you know what the waswas of love is? If you ever fallen in love and you're standing in front of your beloved, you're, that waswasa, am I, am I straight? Is my cross right? Am I saying the right thing? Am I making a fool out of myself? Is my hair straight? That's the waswas of love for women. What about the waswas of love for Allah when you're standing in front of Him? That's what Allah is interested in. But look at the prayer. Look at our prayer. We clock in into the prayer and say, Allahu Akbar, and we go around the world. We go everywhere. We do business transactions. We go on vacation. We come up with brilliant business ideas. We do all these stuff. We have meetings and our prayer. And then we come back to the prayer right when we say, Salaam Alaikum. That's the prayer. Iqbal Rahmatullah said, just make, he said, make sure that your sajda doesn't make you a kafir. تیرے سجدے کہی تجھے کافر نہ کر دے اقبال تو جبتا کہی اور ہے سوچتا ہے کہی اور make sure that your sajda doesn't make you a kafir because you're bowing down to someone physically but you're with somebody else spiritually this is our sajda this is our ruku this is how we pray this is the prayer has become this ritual that we are not even there as salah imad al deen is a central pillar of this religion. Look what Allah is saying. He's saying that woe unto those who pray. Alladinahum an salatihim sahum. Woe unto the worshiper for those who are neglectful in their prayers. Neglectful in their prayers. Not that they don't pray, but there are people who don't, who don't care about prayer. Well, I do people, oh, pray, no pray, it's okay. The difference between a believer and a non-believer is a prayer. But the, the, the amazing thing about this religion, Wallahi, Wallahi, you, you appreciate this. Go research every religion on this planet and see how, they, how their prophet prayed. Research every, every religion, Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, no offense to any religion. Research it. None of them know how their prophet prayed. None of them. 
They don't know how the prophet, their prophets pray. We know how he prayed. We know how he stood. We know where he put his hands. We know what he said first, what he said second, what he said third. How did he go to Ruku? How was his back when he went to Ruku? What was his fingers when he sat? What did he do? At tashahud. When he stood up. How did he stood up? What did he put his hands for? His nose? His forehead for? This, we know every single detail. We know how he prepared for prayer, how he did his wudu, all of that. There's so much detail. Look at the fifth book. The fuqaha here. Look at the fifth books. I mean, the, the chapter on wudu and prayer is like a book. Hundreds of pages. You think it's not important? The most talked about subject in the Quran is as salam. He starts the book, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He starts it with after al-Fatiha. Alif lam min dhalik al-kitabu la rayba fi. Hudan lil mutaqin. For who? Al-ladhina yu'minuna bil ghayb. Wa yu'imuna salat. Those who believe in the ghayb. Because if you don't believe in the ghayb, you're not going to pray. Because prayer came from the ghayb. It came from the alam al-amr, from the unseen world. Every ruling was revealed down on the earth. Every ruling. Except the prayer. That Allah took his messenger to the heavens. To his divine presence and give him the prayer. That's salah. That is prayer. This is the value of the prayer. And it's out of the mercy of Allah that He has given us that that we can have our mi'raj five times a day. But we go everywhere except going to Allah. This is the problem. We go everywhere except going to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because we don't know. If you give gold to the goldsmith, they know how to use it. They would appreciate it. But if you give it to somebody who doesn't know gold, they would treat it like copper. They would treat it like zinc. That's how they would treat it. This is how we are treating the prayer. as salat This is how we are treating it. And, and look at the... When the prayer comes in, this is the ulama, the awliya. They pray the moment it came in. If you travel, if people have been to Mauritania, it's like there's a class going on. And I witnessed this myself. In the middle of the class, somebody walks out, go outside, and they measure their shadow if the prayer is in or not. And they will come back, sit down, 10 to 5 minutes later, somebody else will go and they measure. They're just waiting for the prayer. As soon as it comes in, Allahu Akbar, everybody goes, establish the prayer. You know why? Because if they die, and the prayer is in, you're responsible for that prayer. So they wanted to get it done. Had they, if they die after the prayer, between Asr and Maghrib, that they prayed their Asr, right on time, they're not going to be asking Allah, I did all my prayers. I established all my prayers. And if you can't pass the test of prayers on the Yom Al-Qiyamah, everything else is going to be hard. I put a call to have a Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidi al-Mursaleen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi al-Ma'een bi rahmatiki ya rahmat rahimin One of the, there's a few things in the prayer One of the prayer Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an Aqim al-Salaq, establish prayer Whenever Allah says something, there's a reason why He says it He just doesn't just say things Inna al-Salaq tanha an al-Fahshahi wal-Munka that prayer by its nature, in other words, the essence of prayer is that it will protect you from fahsha, from fornication, and from every monka, from every evil act. That's what prayer does. If people have problem with all these diseases of the heart, they have to establish the prayer on time and make the prayer with love. Because if, you, if prayer is, is, is given by Allah with love, but you have to, and also you have to establish it with love. That's the secret of prayer. You have to establish it with love. But prayer is also is a toba. Because toba means in Arabic to turn. That's what it means. Literally it means to turn. That's why Allah is a tawab, the one who always turns towards you. And it's five times a day we turn. The first thing that we do, we say, okay, which way is the qibla? Right? That's the first thing. We turn toward the qibla to make our toba. To make our toba to Allah. And people, you know, you know, people who miss prayers and and neglectful in their prayer, they have to make Tawbah and come back. They have to make Tawbah. This is, the, the religion is not a religion of hopelessness. This deen, the foundation of this deen is hope. Is hope. But, don't think things are small. When you, oh, it's, I just missed a few prayers here and there. Who cares? No. 
you're sinning against the Rabbul Alameen. You're sinning against the Rabbul Alameen. The, uh, one of the, the, the poets said it beautifully. He said, he said, Shaitan ke randa shud, bajuz yak khata naka, khud ra barai sajdei adam raza naka. When this, the reason why Satan was driven from the kingdom of God, it was because of one sin. He just refused, he didn't make prostration to Adam. He said, Shaitan hazar martaba behtar za namaz, ku sajda ra ba adam u in bar khuda naka. He said, Satan is a thousand times better than the one who doesn't pray. Because he refused to pray, to prostrate to Satan, but you're refusing to prostrate to Allah. You're refusing to prostrate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He didn't refuse to make sajda to Allah. He refused to make sajda to Adam. And look what happened to him. Look what happened to him. Wallahi, if you want security in your life, if you want peace in your life, if you want success in your life, in all of those things, if you look at the life of the Prophet after Islam Miraj, it was just completely opening after opening after opening. Medina opened up. They came back and 13 years, 14 years later after this incident, they come back and they take over uh, Mecca. Conquest of Mecca happened. All of that came. The, the secret of that was a salah, that Allah gave this, this prayer. <coughs> Allah gave this prayer to us. Wallahi is, is the greatest gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and is given from him to his beloved who brought it down to us. And he, he actually, the, his prayer is exactly how Allah told him to pray. Is exactly how Allah told him to pray. No other religion, no other, no other. Uh, look at all of the religions of the world. Nobody has that. Nobody has that. But you know, we have to come back in the doors of Toba. I mean, the the, the the greatest gift of Islam after the prayer is Toba, because previous uh, religions, if they made a uh, major sin, they had to kill themselves. That was their Toba. And when Islam was revealed. Toba replaced that suicide, that killing. He said, no, you make Toba will kill that action in you that you did. We will kill the action that you did. You don't have to kill your own nafs. So to come back, come back through the door of Toba. It's open all the time. The door of Toba is open all the time. And Allah is, a, a, he, we have the most <coughs> merciful God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And look at the Prophet. Look at the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his mercy. That even on the night that he's with Allah, what is he thinking about? About us. What am I going to take to my ummah? That's what he's thinking about. He's thinking about us. He's thinking about us. So may Allah make us from amongst those who will establish the prayer. Amen. And when we establish the prayer, we establish it with love. Amen. We establish it with sidq. And we establish the prayer, inshallah, that it will be a matter that one time in our life we experience. We experience this, the sweetness of our prayer. We experience the sweetness of a prayer. So we can, inshallah, pray like that for the rest of our life. They're awliya, that's the maqam of awliya, that they always pray as though they're in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we are in front of Allah. It's just that we are unaware of it. All of us, we are just unaware of it. Wallahi, we're just, we are there. When you stand, the moment you say, Allahu Akbar, you leave this reality. You leave this reality and you go to the divine presence. Just enjoy that. Enjoy those moments. Enjoy those moments when, when, when you're with your Lord. And don't go around the world. Don't go around the world doing transactions and doing business and come with great ideas. Because there's a specific Satan that is for prayer. And this is the proof that when, whatever comes to your mind on the prayer, you don't think about it throughout the day except during the prayer time. The moment you say, Allahu Akbar, he clocks in. And he's, his job is to take you out of your prayer. And it's amazing that every time all the thoughts that comes to your head, the moment he says, Salaam Alaikum, you don't think about it anymore. You're done. Because that was his job. His job was just to distract you from your prayer. And he did his job. He's out till the next prayer. The moment he says, Allahu Akbar, he comes in. And it's usually the same thing. It's the same journey that everybody, everybody who tells me, so you know what, I do this all the time. I do this and I do that. It's the same shaitan. That's it. It's just he's got your number. He's got your number. So you have to break the pattern. And by the way, you, the way you break the pattern is you change your prayer. If you, you pray, start slow. A lot of people, they just go in the ritual. No, just do it. Take twice as long. Do your prayers as good as your wudu. Look how, you know, wallahi, I saw one of the shiuch, a Mauritanian shiuch make wudu. And I thought that, man, my wudu has been invalid ever since I, because the way he made wudu, it was like an art. Sheikh Khatri, like he was making wudu. I'm like, 
Subhanallah, this is how you make wudu. Like it was an it was an act of worship. Wudu is an act of worship. It's not just a pre-prayer ablution. It is an act of worship, so we should treat it like that. And your prayer is as good as your wudu. Your prayer is as good as your wudu. So may Allah give us the strength to make proper wudu and learn our faith, inshallah, to do wudu, to do the prayer in a way that Allah and His Messenger commanded us to do. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, salli'u astaghfirullah, wa'udhu billahi min shuroo yu'n fursana min sayyati amalina ma nihdi illa fara amudin lana wa ma jillil falahadi la ashiru la ilahi wa allahu atuhu la sharika la wa ashiru anna alhamdu wa al-abduhu wa rasulu wa arsaluhu wa al-khuda bashiran wa nadhiran Qala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fi Qur'ani majid إن الله ملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما صليت على سيدنا إبراهيم وعلى آل سيدنا إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد وقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أرحم أمتي بأمتي أبو بكر وأشهدهم في أمر الله عمر وأصلاهم في عمر عثمان وأقضاهم عن أيام فاتمة سيدة النساء أهل الجنة وحسن بن حسين سيدة أشهد أهل الجنة وحمزة أصل الله وأصل الرسول خير القرون قرون ثم الذين يرونهم ثم الذين يرونهم إن الله يعمر بالعبد والإحسان من كيد القرى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر فقيل ما لكم تذكرون فاذكروا لي أذكركم واشكروا لي ولا تذكروا وذكروا الله أكبر وأقيموا الصلاة